Hello, so this is how to describe NSX to your grandma. I'm Simon Hamilton Wilkes. This is Hans Bernhardt. Uh, usual disclaimer. So, why the title? Um, we like to start by being realistic and saying grandma already has an electrical engineering degree, um, but she doesn't know this thing about NSX. Now, part of the challenge here is she. Um, we need to describe it to her in a way that is uh, very uh, uh, simple, the same way you would describe this type of thing to a child. So tongue-in-cheek title, title, why would I describe this to, to grandma? And this kind of came out of the Einstein attributed quote, if you can't describe something to a six-year-old, you don't understand it well enough. And the same thing applies to an 86-year-old. Now who are we? So I'm Simon Hamilton Wilkes. I am an architect in the Alliances Org for NSX Security and Operations Partners. I've been with VMware for three and a half years and prior to that I was with F5 Networks and prior to that I was in the networking channel selling Cisco and NetApp and whatnot. And I'm Hans Bernhardt. I've been with VMware for 17 years. Uh, what I refer to myself as is a special generalist, <laughs> generalist, general specialist specialist having taught myself IT throughout the years and I come from the angle of like teaching myself NSX and digesting it into bits and pieces that people can understand. So we're coming together to do this presentation for you to help the light bulb go off above grandma's head. With that said, I'll start off with a brief history of virtualization. You may notice that Simon is very polished and I forgot to shave. Well, I'm a virtual caveman who can go back in time here and go to these slides that many of you uh, can and should know already about uh, basic virtualization. The, the, matter, the fact of the matter being we threw a hypervisor on a physical server and simply abstracted the compute resources, the memory resources, the networking resources, and storage resources from the physical server. These principles are the same principles we're going to apply to network virtualization in a moment here. If we extend this beyond a single physical server, we see this old slide from 19, oh gosh, I'm sorry, 2007 or 9, but we extend this beyond the, the physical server across a cluster of servers, and we start to realize we have a like, distributed environment to not just realize uh, virtual machines, but also to realize additional services that we can stick in a hyper hypervisor and then distribute them, such as dynamic resource scheduling, high availability, and so on and so forth. So use this thought process um, while you explore uh, NSX networking. With that said, Simon would like to take over the caveman role. So this is the evolution of networking back from the coax cable, uh, which originally was the big thick yellow coax cable where you had to put vampire taps in at certain marks on the cable to get the timing just right on all this stuff. And then uh, we moved on where we invented bridges and so we could separate broadcast domains because back in those days before Moore's Law had got to work, the interrupts generated by receiving broadcasts when you got to a big network were enough to sap all the strength out of your computer. Uh, then we move up and we switches were created and then we, you know, we all went to Cat5 and then we went to Gigabit and yada yada yada. And then finally we get to NSX and we've, you know, the, the, the new age has, has dawned. So we've gone from just one cable between everybody to multiple cables and switches, and then we get into this virtual world um, and, and NSX. And the, sort of the important thing to understand is back in the old days, everything was on the one cable. So everybody saw everybody else's traffic, and broadcast was a necessary th a thing that just worked because everybody saw everybody else's traffic. Bro the broadcast bit in a frame meant actually look at that frame and punt it up to the processor, have an interrupt, look at the frame, figure out if it's VB or not, and something you need to act upon. So as we've got more complicated and away from that shared medium where everybody's on the same physical wire, we've had to get further and further in, in complexity to emulate that scenario where everybody's on the same wire. So be it uh, LAN emulation, which was this thing we had in the 90s to make um, ATM look like a thick wire, to software-defined networking now, where we've still got to do all this complexity to make things look like everything's on one wire, 
we're still having to do the, all this complexity to make things look like we're all on one wire and the higher ev level application protocols have to believe that they are on this simple network which is just a shared wire. Now, speaking of protocols and speaking of layers. Uh, so, so when we talk about layers, this is, this is what we're talking about. So this is the OSI reference model, which is a lot of network certifications still teach. Um, and a lot of probably comes up in college courses on networking and other courses on networking. It's basically a way of uh, stratifying networking so that you can have demarcation points between the network, between the layers, so that you don't have to implement the whole thing as one great lump. You can bite off individual portions and you can have demarcation points and handoff points between them so that when you're implementing a protocol, you can just uh, implement one protocol in one layer and then hand off to the next thing. You, you don't want to have to invent uh, Ethernet networking every time you write a web browser. This would be ridiculous. So we've got all these different layers. And then the other thing to know about this model is that this isn't the model that kind of applies to TCP and the networking we use now. The OSI wrote this model based around connectionless networking and the networking that they wrote which was in many ways superior to, to IP, just like in some ways Token Ring, in my opinion, was superior to Ethernet, but it, they didn't win the battle of the standards. So in, in the end, we've ended up all using IP, which kind of maps into this model, but not exactly. But th the model is still a valuable thing because it gives you these layers, and then when you're implementing something or when you're troubleshooting, you can start at the bottom and work up, and you can say, is the cable plugged in? That's layer one. All right, do we have a MAC address and an IP address? Can we see, if we do an ARP minus A, do we see other uh, MAC addresses on the network? If we do a ping, can we ping our local gateway? And, and so on and so on. You can work your way up the stack. So in other words, um, what I hear Simon saying is that present networking, networking 101, operates with this network stack of layers, and we need to start looking at each one of these layers and what they do, and then moving these layers into the hypervisor for virtualized networking associated with each one of these layers is not just a function but also a protocol and that this is where we introduce your grandma's protocol soup so oh, you yeah, know we don't expect everybody to understand or recognize all of these um, radio in the audience here invented spanning tree so it's not often you have somebody in the audience that invented one of the protocols on the screen <laughs> um, but these protocols all do different things and were designed to do different things, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're now being used for the things they were designed to do. Border Gateway Protocol is the routing protocol of the internet, but has become a widely used reachability protocol within the data center. So uh, interior gateway routing protocols, which are the usual routing protocols for uh, IP networks within an organization, the link state ones build this very complicated map of the entire topology that they know about. But in a data center uh, of a modern design with, with a leaf spine, um, it's not necessarily valuable to hold all that information and do those calculations. So BGP has become this thing reused for that instead, because BGP is more of a reachability protocol in that context, because it really only cares about a prefix and what the next hop is. So you can have a much smaller and more lightweight thing, even though it's this very complicated protocol with policy-based routing and all this stuff in the internet context, in a data center context, it can be used or misused to just be a reachability protocol to, to um, tell you where to get the next, where you can need to go to get to the next hop. And you can use that with equal cost multipath to distribute packets and spray them from one pop hop to another and allow a lot of uh, fault tolerance and performance. So go backwards a second. All right. Say go back a lot. VMware virtualization, slap a hypervisor on a physical uh, a, a server, understand the principles of abstraction. We want to virtualize networking. We talk about the layers that make up the network. Then we say, well, each one of these layers has a function and has protocols associated with that function. Simon went into some of these protocols. And what we want to tell you here is to learn this 
uh, learn those layers and study up on some of these protocols. Go to Wikipedia, read, and you'll get dragged into a long-winded uh, session of looking at these protocols. But as you learn these layers and how they operate, and you learn how these protocols operate, you start to realize we want to move these things into the hypervisor. We want to virtualize these things. And with that said, we want to start before we go to VMware network virtualization, we want to look at a physical network virtualization before VMware even existed. Um, and this is uh, something called um, VLANs, uh, Virtual um, Local Area Networks. So this was just a simple way of being able to have different um, broadcast domains and different IP subnets usually um, carried on a single wire. And all we're doing is adding a little tag to each frame, saying this frame belongs to VLAN 10, this frame belongs to VLAN 20. And we're making the frame, we're stealing a field in that frame, we're making the frame a bit longer, depending on which, what protocol we're using. And then we're able to have 4,094 VLANs on a single wire. And this is really useful when we're trying to separate traffic out for various reasons, either for quality of service, or because of multi-tenancy, or whatever else. And then we get, to, we get to reuse that sort of principle as things get more complicated. And now, here's the interesting thing. We are exploring you know, what we've done with physical networks and the, the ability to tunnel VLANs inside of a physical network. That's something that's accepted in the industry. VMware's initial go at network virtualization was simply the virtual switch on an ESX server. And at that point, all we were doing was imitating a layer two switch, an ethernet switch on an ESX host. That's all we did. We didn't do all those layers that you saw there. We just did layer two. Well, then we said, let's distribute that across multiple ESX servers. And that's when we created the distributed virtual switch, where now virtual machines, when they moved around between physical servers, they, they thought they were still on that layer two subnet. So, so the issue we had with the standard virtual switch was once you introduced vMotion, or live motion of VMs from one host to another, every, all the consistency had to be there in the way the virtual switch was defined, or you'd move a VM from one host to another and it would lose connectivity. So yeah, we put in a test for that, so it wouldn't actually move if the connectivity if it thought the connectivity wasn't going to be there. But you'd get issues like if the VLAN had a different name because one was uppercase or one was lowercase or something like that, it wouldn't work. So the distributed switch fixed that by having a, a dedicated control plane for the vSwitch, which is often vCenter, and it made that consistency an, an easy thing to achieve. So now this is where we say VMware has virtualized that virtual switch and the hypervisor and then distributed across multiple hypervisors. But we want to take it farther and then we want to virtualize every one of those layers uh, that we showed you in the stack. So this is where we get into, well, what is NSX? You know, NSX is called a, you know, buzzwords, a network overlay. Well, you see on the slide, network hypervisor. Well, what does that mean? What's this network overlay? What's this network hypervisor? So we're doing a very similar thing to VLANs. We are taking a layer two frame, and we're encapsulating it in a UDP packet in this case, and adding a little tag saying this belongs to such and such network. So it's an overlay, it's, it's over the top. And that means that the VMs can be on different hosts and different data centers even, but believe they're layer two adjacent. They believe they're still on this single piece of thick yellow cable that they, well, they might have been on in the early 80s or something. Um, because we are fudging the appearance of that with a whole load of complexity on the top. And the network overlays the simple bit, and then we, we add controllers and stuff to make broadcasts and unknowns and multicast work and keep track of what, um, VMs and what MAC addresses lie beyond what virtual tunneling endpoints or VTAPs as we're going to get to in a minute. So I'm going to have some fun with this and I'm going to re-describe what, what Simon said. And I'll go back to the beginning again. Physical server, hypervisor, abstracts physical resources to virtual resources. We understand that that hypervisor can have things that run inside of it that go way beyond just giving us virtual machines. Well, we started by putting a virtual switch on the hypervisor. That was just layer two. We then 
stretch that virtual switch across multiple hypervisors. That was still just layer two. Well, then we said with NSX, we want to create this whole NSX hypervisor, but we want to take advantage of some additional technologies here um, in combination with the existing physical technology underneath the hood. So if you go back to this initial slide here with VLANs, we understand that, yeah, VLANs just exist. That's part of our physical network now. We have this capability of tunneling VLANs on layer two on, on, on our physical network. But then we go to this network hypervisor where we say our ESX servers have hypervisors. And inside those hypervisors, we take advantage of additional tunneling or additional tagging of our network traffic with something called VXLAN. And VXLAN gives us the ability to create separate networks um, on the fly based on the VXLAN tag. It's just a matter of, like Simon said, you take network traffic and you tag it with a number. And then you untag it on the other side and that becomes a network wire or a logical network based on the VXLAN tag. So I can take, say, VXLAN 6000 Take my traffic, tag it with 6,000, send it across the wire, untag it, and two machines that use those tags will be able to see each other. So notice in the slide, we can combine these VXLANs inside our existing physical uh, networks and the VLANs. So there's some huge advantages here. One being that VXLANs um, allow for 16 million potential networks versus VLANs only allowing for 4,000 potential networks. So 4,094 sounded like a lot, I think, when they were coming up with that, but the uh, issue becomes quickly, if you're in a large campus environment or a large data center, you can run through those pretty fast, particularly if you want to use a logical arrangement where these several hundred are for voice, and these several hundred are for access, and these are for such and such application, and these are for that. You, you, can, you can go through them pretty quick. So this is where it gets fun now because you now have this network hypervisor running on um, your ESX servers, but it's basically just NSX stuff running in the ESX server hypervisor, but we're aggregating these ESX servers together, so now we have everything distributed, so we can call it a network hypervisor. And then we do this VXLAN tagging to create these separate networks based on the VXLAN number. So if you look at the slide, you see, okay, you have a physical network with VLAN 20. On top of that, you have the hypervisor, the network hypervisor, the multiple hypervisors of our servers running VXLAN 7000 and VXLAN 6000. You see two virtual machines connected on VXLAN 7000 all that means is that their traffic gets tagged and untagged and sent to each other. But you see that VXLAN 6000, its traffic is being tagged at layer two as 6000, meaning it's on a completely separate network. So our network hypervisor is keeping these two separate from each other. And you wanted to make a point about firewalls? Uh, I was gonna say, and the underlying network can't see either of them because it, these, are, these are abstracted one layer up. Uh, and the other point I was going to make about the tagging is the tagging gives us our only hardware underlay networking requirement that NSX has, which is that we have to be able to support frames longer than 1500 bytes, which is the standard Ethernet frame. Because we're adding that tag, we have to have 1560 or 1600 byte minimum MTU. So, and this is cool because you set up that physical network once and it just becomes a pipe for everything we send it from the hypervisors. The hypervisors do this network tagging and you get a virtual network, a logical network per each VXLAN tag. So there's your network hypervisor and then your virtual machines can be on these logical networks. So we've given you now layer two logical networks that can span a data center and beyond, not just a single cluster of ESX servers. But wait, there's more. The question becomes, what about all those other layers? Have we, how do you virtualize those layers? It's the same thing as we've been saying. You have a physical server, you have a hypervisor, you abstract the physical resources in that hypervisor, while you abstract these network layers we showed you in the hypervisor. Or you can abstract those layers in a dedicated virtual machine. That's the fun part here. It can either be in a hypervisor and distributed across physical servers, or whatever that function is can be stuck in a dedicated virtual machine. 
the first thing we'll look at here now that we have our network overlay is simply let's go to layer three, which is TCP IP, layer three, IP addresses. You need routing between your layer three subnets, 1.1.1, and 1.1.1.0, 2.2.2.0. Well, now we're one layer up from layer two. You see the little green circle there that represents the distributed, vir distributed virtual router. And now, if we look more closely, you see these two virtual machines can now talk to each other because even though they're not in that same layer two VXLAN, above that, they are on the layer three IP lands, but now we have a distributed virtual router that goes between them, and the distributed virtual router actually runs in a, the hypervisors across our ESX servers. Where this gets uh, cool, or even more cool, cool, um, is if you look, you see that the one virtual machine says, hey, I can see you now, but I can't see you on ports 80 and 443, common ports for um, SSL and just basic uh, web traffic. Well, that's because we can now stick in the hypervisors across our ESX servers a distributed firewall. What that does is it simply says, um, if the network traffic from a virtual machine goes straight into the hypervisor and we have immediate control over it, we can block it, we can only allow portions of it through, but we can micro-segment our virtual machines from each other, meaning we can completely block them from talking to each other, or like I said, we can allow specific traffic through, but it opens up all kinds of possibilities for security. So this is happening at the VNIC level? So this is at the VNIC before traffic has got as far as the virtual switch. So at this point, we are able to say, is this permitted traffic by the security policy? And we can you know, go into the distributed security policy stuff on NSX in a moment. But we have that level of control that the traffic isn't even hitting the virtual switch at this point. So we've got a huge degree of control and, and no matter of uh, compromising that machine or changing its IP address or its MAC address or anything else changes that security policy because it's effectively a firewall right in the hardware of the virtual machine, the virtual hardware. And so now you've got layer two and layer three and now distributed virtual firewall, other services that we can virtualize, we can load balance. Load balancing is done with that virtual appliance, that virtual machine where you put the load balancing service inside the actual virtual machine. Um, we can also do NAT networking, VPN, and more by using these virtual appliances. So you have a combination of either distributing this, the, the layer, the service across the hypervisors, or sticking them in a virtual machine and using that as a dedicated virtual machine. So, so the virtual service. machine is this thing called the Edge Services Gateway, and um, you know that's analogous to a virtual appliance from a firewall manufacturer or a routing manufacturer a few years ago. And those were fairly successful in certain industries and certain verticals, but they always had the problem of performance. Because they're running as a virtual machine in user space, they don't have privileged access to the physical hardware of the host, and they, they don't have as much um, CPU access as the actual vSphere kernel does, necessarily. So being able to move functions into the vSphere kernel, which is what we've done with distributed routing and the distributed routing. firewall, <laughs> we, can, we can beg to differ, um, gives us that very, very fast scale out performance where they can be basically wire speed services and they can scale out as your cluster scales out to, into the terabit plus range. So with all that said, basically NSX, network overlay, and then you start adding additional layers and services on top of that, like we've done for you here. And the last piece of this slide shows you it's all programmatically controlled, meaning it's cloud consumable. The NSX front end says, hey, I have APIs, and you can put a cloud management system in front of me, such as uh, VCD or vRealize Automation. And that cloud management system can simply say, hey, Virtual Center, go deploy those virtual machines. Hey, NSX go deploy VXLANs, give those virtual machines networks to talk on. Hey NSX, give me a distributed virtual router so those virtual machines can talk to each other on layer three with IP. Oh wait, these virtual machines need a load balancer, deploy an edge gateway for the, the load balancing. Oh wait, we need micro-segmentation in a secure sense, go micro-segment these virtual machines uh, with the distributed virtual firewall. 
So the next question becomes, I mean, this is the end result of like what we can do with NSX. The next question becomes, and I'll hand over to Simon on this one, how is this implemented behind the scenes? And so this is where grandma, you know. So, so this is where, you know, the, the, the physical or virtual manifestation of NSX actually happens. So in the whole software defined networking thing, we've got a data plane, a control plane, and a management plane. So at the data plane, that's where packets and frames actually move backwards and forwards. So that's where the traffic actually is, and that obviously is you know where the rubber hits the road. And if you if it breaks, you don't have any traffic anymore. So that's bad. But the data plane is in the ESXi kernel. So worst case, you lose a host, and then hopefully high availability restarts whatever VMs were running on that host elsewhere in the cluster, and life goes on. The NSX edge are these gateways that we were talking about where higher touch services like load balancing, NAT, um, VPN are, are um, served by this virtual appliance. They could, those can be deployed in a high availability mode where you have an active and a standby for some services. Or if you're just doing um, VXLAN encapsulation, decapsulation, and IP routing, then you get to deploy those in a uh, thing called equal cost multipath where you can have a whole bunch of them and spray packets backwards and forwards between them and your physical top of rack switches which can also be highly available. And then you have controllers which is a cluster of three for high availability so there's always a quorum of who, who is in charge and that you don't have a dual active situation which you could have with two. And then the manager is just the API and the GUI entry point. So if that goes down for 90 seconds while HA starts it somewhere else all you've lost is your ability to make changes. So it's, it's non-critical. So what I've heard Simon say is, you know, back to that NSX in action being used behind the scenes, you see at the data plane, you see that distributed virtual switch, you see the VXLANs on a distributed virtual switch, you see the distributed logical router, you see the distributed firewall. That's the data plane. That's the stuff that's happening for your virtual machines. The NSX edge working with that, above that, is actually providing additional services such as NAT networking or VPN or load balancing. And then to control all these networks, to see these VXLANs and, and make sure we know where they're at and what virtual machines are on what, you have these machines called the NSX controllers. And to manage this, to give you a human seeable interface, but also to give you APIs that a cloud management system can consume, you have the NSX manager. And on top of the stack, you have something like, again, vRealize Automation to talk to NSX manager and say, give me these uh, network constructs. And then finally, where to find more? Obviously, there's tons and tons of stuff on the VMware website. Um, there's also various books that we've published, like Microsegmentation for Dummies, which is a good introduction to NSX. There's some other NSX books that the VMware gives away. Um, I like the Douglas Coma books for understanding how TCP works and and I like stuff. the dummy books <laughs> yeah and Hans likes the dummies books but the greatest resource is hands-on labs because then you can learn by doing and absorb information sometimes that way is better than books anyway and no joke the uh, networking for dummies and network virtualization for dummies and micro segmentation for dummies we these books are actually in PDF form on our on our website or at least the micro segmentation and network virtualization for dummies it's good stuff to read. The point being, and it's why we have done this presentation for you, is it can be extremely complex when you get into all the nuances of networking. But if you divide it out into, I understand the basics of virtualization, I understand the hypervisor and it's abstracting these resources. Well, what am I trying to abstract here? Well, now I understand the seven layers of the, you know, the OSI model and these layers of, and functionality. Well, I need to study a little bit to understand the protocols and functions that are associated with these layers. Then I need to see how these layers are implemented in the NSX hypervisor or the hypervisors across ESF servers and or in a um, virtual machine. Okay, um, with that, thank you very much and we're around for some questions and answers afterwards. Woohoo! Thank you.